take it away. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for today's meeting of the consulting group on the establishment of a legal specialization in privacy law. Um, we are going to um, to start with a welcome note and a call to order and followed by the roll call. So starting with the agenda, uh, we want to note to everyone present that a Zoom meeting, like a regular in-person meeting of the Privacy Law Group is recorded and will be archived on the State Bar's website. We will, the Privacy Law Group will be discussing items um, in the agenda 2D and 2E first, and the remaining items will be in order. At this time, we were going to go to roll call. Janelle? Joy? Davis? Here. Hersonson? Here. Isri? Here. Jaworski? Kale? Here. Uh, sorry, Arson. Uh, Curie and Nian? Are you here? Here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Corley? Here. Oh, perfect. Lenos? Paul? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Martinez? Present. Rajamon? Rajmohan Smitha? Yeah, I'm here. Serato? Here. Unica? Here. Everyone is present. We have quorum. All right. Thank you, Janelle. Right, uh, next item on the agenda is 2B. We're going to move to approve the March 23rd, 2023 consulting group on the establishment of a legal specialization in privacy, uh, privacy law public meeting notes. Uh, we have all received a copy of the meeting notes from the last meeting. And so uh, we uh, asked all the members of the group to, uh, to take the time to review. And um, having reviewed the meeting notes from the last time, do we have a motion uh, to approve the meeting notes? Motion to approve the March 23rd meeting notes. Do we have a second? Second. Right. We have a first motion by Jaworski and a second motion by Unaka. We have approval of the meeting notes from March 23rd. We need to take a roll call. We need to take roll call. Thank you, and Janelle. So uh, now that we have the two motions, we will move to take roll call, uh, which Janelle, uh, we will do to approve the meeting notes. Thank you. Choi? Davis? Here. Um, Hersonson? Here. Approve. Isri? Approve. Jaworski? Approved. Kelly? Approved. Karini Anand? Arson? Uh, approved. Lenoyce? Approved. Martinez? Approved. Rajahan? Approved. Serato? Approved. Uh, and Unica? Unica, approved. Unica, thank you. Uh, the meeting minutes have been approved for March 23rd, 2023. Thank you, Janelle. Okay, now we're going to move to item 1C, and we have instructions for public uh, comment. The Board of Trustees recently adopted a public comment policy that applies to all state bar committees, including this one. Its policy statement says the State Bar of California welcomes public comment at all of its public meetings, and appreciates listening to a wide range of viewpoints that reflect the diversity of California. Those public comment rules are designed to ensure that members of the public may exercise their right to be heard, as well as ensure that the State Bar is able to fulfill its obligation to conduct public business on behalf of the pe people of California in a timely fashion. Written public comment may be submitted to the email address on the meeting agenda. We encourage you to submit written public comments at least 24 hours prior to the start of a meeting. 
Written comments received less than 24 hours prior to the start of a meeting will be distributed the following business day. If you bring written materials to a meeting for distribution, they will be collected by the meeting secretary and distributed after the meeting concludes. For oral public comments, persons were encouraged to sign up to speak in advance of the meeting and will be called in the order that they have signed up. Persons attending the meeting remotely will be called in the order that they appear in the attendee list. And in a moment, I'll explain how to raise your hand to tell us that, if, that you want to do that. Those joining us in the room today wishing to make a public comment may sign up on a sign-in sheet that was available right outside the entrance to our meeting room. This applies if we were meeting in person. Speakers cannot cede their time to another speaker. It does not guarantee that all who wish to speak will be able to do so to facilitate hearing from as many members as possible. We encourage you not to repeat points uh, that were made by previous speakers. Simply say that you agree with them to allow the committee the time needed to deliberate on the important topics that we will be discussing today. We'll be limiting public comments to three minutes per person. We'll be lim uh, as a reminder, the State Bar's uh, anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy says the State Bar maintains zero tolerance for unlawful harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. Employees must at all times treat all other employees, job applicants, and persons providing services to the State Bar with respect and dignity in accordance with this policy. Likewise, the State Bar will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, or retaliation against its employees, job applicants, or members of the public by any employees or by any person with whom the State Bar has a business service or a professional relationship. If you're in Zoom and want to speak, you'll need to raise your hand unless you are already on the pre-meeting sign-up list. To do so, you click on the hand icon that's at the bottom center of your Zoom window. If you're participating by telephone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That's the star key and then the number nine. Our coordinator will call members of the public, starting with the pre-signups, then the Zoom list, followed by in-person signups in the order that they raised their hands or signed up. Staff will enable the microphones of the speaker, start the timer, and then call out when 30 seconds remain. Do we have anyone that wishes to make comments? There are no members of the public nor signups. Okay. And I don't believe we have any planned guests, so we will move on to the business portion of the meeting today, starting with item 2D. Okay. 2D is the review and discussion of member research regarding privacy cases uh, filed by California licensees. And we have Hillary and Mariah leading the discussion. Um, Hillary? Yes, thank you. I will begin. So um, are you, you have control of the slides. Wonderful. Okay. So generally we review cases in the past three years, focusing on uh, the following causes of action. Uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, the California Confidentia Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, and the California Invasion of Privacy Act. In reviewing these cases, we analyze the data we found under the framework of the following questions. Are California privacy cases represented by attorneys, or are they pro se? How do these privacy laws impact the California public? How do these privacy laws impact businesses? How would a privacy law specialization benefit the public? How would a privacy law specialization benefit licensees of the state bar? And finally, how would a privacy law specialization advance the state bar's mission? The first three questions can be evaluated under each law, and while the last three will benefit from a more global discussion at the end. So first we'll turn to the California Consumer Privacy Act, which should be the first slide. All right, so the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, was signed into law in 2018 and became effective on January 1, 2020. The law intends to give California residents with the right to control identifiable data about them, also known as personal information. It gives California residents the right to know what personal information is collected about them, know whether their personal information is sold or disclosed and to whom, opt out or to say no uh, to the sale of their personal information, access their personal information collected by businesses, 
request that a business delete their personal information and not be discriminated against for exercising their privacy rights. The law applies to businesses, which can generally be understood to be for-profit entities uh, that collect personal information about California residents and hit certain gross revenue thresholds. Uh, businesses also have a responsibility to ensure the personal information they hold about California residents is secure. The law gives residents a private right of action, meaning they can sue a business directly for a violation of their rights and seek damages. So looking at the cases, there were 34 cases filed really since uh, January 2020, since the law only dates to then, but we did look at the past three years really, or the, since then. This is the start date. So of these cases, none were pro se, meaning that no one represented themselves. Everyone was represented by an attorney. Uh, most had to do with a violation of the obligation to keep data secure, stemming from someone who isn't authorized to access the data accessing the personal information, um, or from a large-scale data breach caused by a third party. There were additional allegations relating to unlawful use of personal information to promote a business's services. Most of uh, the defendants included banks, telecommunications providers, healthcare service providers, and healthcare suppliers. Here we can see that these laws are impacting the California public and they are giving them rights to their data that was generally not recognized in the US until this law. It gives California residents the right to control access to their data, not as patients or students, and isn't limited to a particular sector a business may be in, such as banking or healthcare education. It also gives them previously unrecognized rights to enforce how their personal information is shared and secured. So how are these laws impacting businesses? Well, one could surmise that these laws and lawsuits are requiring businesses to critically evaluate their data security and data sharing practices and be more transparent with individuals with respect to how they use their personal information. So really this law is giving these businesses some accountability. Um, so now we're gonna look to the California Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, which is the next slide, or CMIA. So this law protects the confidentiality of individually identifiable medical information obtained by healthcare providers, health insurers, and their contractors. And it puts limitations on how these entities can disclose a patient's medical information, including to employers, and also restricts how employers can use medical information about employees. It generally requires a patient to authorize the disclosure of medical information to another person or entity, it's broader than the federal law that protects medical information, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, since it arguably protects a wider scope of data and also applies to a broader scope of entities, uh, including employers. It also places more restrictions on how this information can be used and disclosed. Unlike HIPAA, uh, the CMIA gives individuals a private right of action meaning that, again, they can seek damages against healthcare providers and others that improperly use or disclose their medical information. So looking at the cases, uh, we limited to three years uh, since March uh, 28, 2020. Uh, since that time, 49 cases were filed that alleged a violation of CMIA. Only one case was filed by a pro se plaintiff. And about 70% of the cases were class action cases, meaning that more than one individual was alleging the same type of wrongdoing by the defendant. Here we can see like CCPA, many of these cases related to large scale breaches of data, but more clearly from third party bad actors and were alleged to be caused by ransomware, a cyber attack or phishing. With the growing use of metapixels, there were also some cases alleging a violation of CMIA by use or sharing of medical information through metapixel, which is a snippet of code that allows companies to track website visitor activities. While most causes of action were against healthcare providers, there were some against employers for failure to adequately protect the confidentiality of COVID-19 vaccination data. There were also many cases where defendants brought motions arguing that they were not subject to CMIA as they were not healthcare providers, insurers, or contractors as defined under the law. Uh, here we see that because federal law does not provide a private right of action and because of the increase in cyber attacks and tracking tools, individuals or patients are seeking recourse for failure to secure their medical information. We also see that employers having increased access to medical information, perhaps due to the pandemic, 
individuals are similarly using this law to ensure employers safeguard the sensitive data. So turning uh, to the last three questions, um, let's see, we will... Um, Should we do SIPA? Oh yeah, sorry, yes, thank you. So turning to the next slide, this is the California Invasion of Privacy Act. We analyzed claims or federal cases brought under SEPA or which included a SEPA claim since March 2019. Uh, SEPA is the California Invasion of Privacy Act. This is a older statute, a law that was enacted in California in 1967 and has had certain amendments since that time. It is the analog to the Federal Wiretapping Act, and it essentially prohibits various forms of intentional recording and eavesdropping without the consent of both parties to the conversation or the interaction. Uh, SEPA also has a private right of action and statutory penalties of up to $5,000 per violation. SEPA has both criminal and civil uh, statutory provisions. We analyzed and looked at the, the civil federal filings. Uh, since March 2019, uh, we found that roughly 50% of SEPA filings were actually filed in the last year or 12 months from 2022 to 2023. Almost all of these filings were filed as putative class actions, so brought by one individual standing um, in the steed of many others or a consumer class. We did see that there were some cases filed in state courts that had then been removed to federal court. That was also a prevalent theme. Uh, there were only a handful of plaintiff law firms who were responsible for this uptick in SEPA filings. We uh, discovered that there were three pro se plaintiff filings or three filings where people were filing on their own behalf as individuals. Um, and we did see some repeat plaintiffs, but in those instances, they were always represented by law firms. Uh, defendants cut across a range of industries, but were primarily larger consumer brands and retailers or ad tech, uh, or somehow operating in the ad tech ecosystem, but not always. Uh, employers and healthcare organizations were also named as defendants in cases that included SEPA claims. Many cases related to the conduct of vendors or third-party chat and software providers. So what we analyzed and what we discovered in the SEPA context is that we had this old law that was being leveraged to address new technologies, specifically chatbots and those sort of online customer service communications, uh, and, and also session replay technologies. Session replay technologies are... Uh, scripts and other sort of pieces of code that allow website operators to analyze user behavior on their website. So the allegations brought by plaintiffs are that this type of uh, tracking is actually in violation of SEPA because you don't have consumer consent and you haven't made the requisite disclosures. Um, Again, the context was chatbots, customer service messaging platforms, et cetera, the session replay technologies. We also noticed a handful of claims were being brought concerning the Amazon Connect Voice ID technology. Um, and many of the complaints included SEPA claims, but also had federal wiretapping claims and privacy torts. So in this instance, plaintiffs are um, trying to address the use and disclosure of their personal information, of their personal potentially communications online that may be occurring without their consent. Next slide, please. I think now we mm -hmm. wanted to address the two excuse me, the three last questions posed on the first slide, Hillary. How would a privacy yeah, law specialization benefit the public? How would a privacy law specialization benefit licensees of the state bar? And how would a privacy law specialization advance the state bar's mission? Our findings suggest that there is a benefit to the public uh, through the specialization of 
a pri through the privacy law specialization. Specifically, these claims are very uh, dependent on an attorney's knowledge of existing privacy-oriented statutes. Uh, plaintiff's attorneys in this instance are also being required to understand new technologies. And we thought that a privacy law specialization could help to both the state bar and all and consumers and also licensees to identify themselves as having the subject matter expertise and the technical expertise required to zealously advocate and proceed with these types of claims. Hillary? That's, that's exactly it, right? It, it, access to attorneys with a greater understanding of where and when privacy laws apply, right? Allowing people to enforce these laws uh, without potentially subjecting defendants to actions that possibly don't have merit. Thank you very much for the presentations, uh, Hillary and Mariah. Uh, from the consulting group, do we have any other additional discussions on item 2D? If not, we will move to item 2E. Okay. Item 2E is going to be presented by Lindsay. The topic is the review and discussion of member research regarding the enforcement actions with privacy focus. Lindsay? Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking my partner in this research, Soyan Choi, who is at a hearing this morning and is unable to join us, um, but uh, she did a great job researching this um, along with myself. Um, so this is going to be a general tour of enforcement actions with a privacy focus around the world. Um, a little bit different from what we just heard, which in, often involved a you know private right of action. We're talking about actions from um, regulators. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. This slide shows um, a picture of a lot of the regulators, not all of them really, but a sampling of, of regulators that are actively enforcing privacy laws in the US, California, and around the world. Um, and we'll go through each of these um, in turn. So we can go to the next slide. Starting with the focus on California, of course, the state attorney general in California has been actively enforcing privacy actions, enforcement actions for many years. Um, on each of these slides, there are resources, including the website to, you know, for the regulator. The, the, the scope of the office of the attorney general here called OAG is is covering many state and federal privacy laws. Here's a sampling. We heard about CCPA. Um, Cal OPA is also listed here, the California Online Privacy Protection Act. And we also heard about CMIA in the last presentation. Um, th these are just a sampling of, of what the Attorney General in California is enforcing. OAG enforcement, the process of it includes filing an action in federal and state district court. Um, and, and they also do a lot of education around consumers and businesses about privacy laws. There is a, a list of enforcement actions and, and there are some, some new CCPA and enforcement case examples um, starting to happen. So uh, with a focus on the, the new California privacy law, the CCPA, uh, the OAG's first enforcement action took place in September 2022 against Sephora, um, and that was a $1.2 million fine. Um, and that was that was really around selling personal information and the disclosure around that sale and the and the process of user requests to opt out of sale um, in violation of the CCPA. And the OAG has been active in sending letters of non-compliance to mobile app businesses that are failing to comply with the CCPA. We expect we'll see more. Um, enforcement as, as time goes on. If you can turn to the next slide. 
a new agency that has been created by the CPRA, which was an amendment to the CCPA, uh, created the California Privacy Protection Agency. So this is a new agency and they are also going to be bringing enforcement actions related to the CCPA. Um, this new agency will bring enforcement actions before an administrative law judge. The California Attorney General will continue its enforcement as well. Um, and that agency will begin enforcement in just about a month, July 1st, 2023. So we'll see both of these California regulators enforcing CCPA um, as, as well as, as other um, state and privacy and state and federal privacy laws um, being addressed by the California Attorney General. Next slide, please. Another de department in California that looks at some uh, privacy issues is the California Department of Public Health. Um, their scope of enforce enforcement is around the Health and Safety Code section uh, 1280.15. They're really looking at um, administ issuing administrative penalties to facilities that breach patients' confidential medical records. Um, and you can see some fines listed here. Um, so they have a list of, of penalties um, and uh, 2018 is, is the last um, action that they've taken really with the, the California Attorney General um, you know, being, being more recently active. Next slide. So moving out to some other states, I, I won't go over this in great detail as I know that there's an item on this. Um, and this is actually, this, this slide is already outdated because more states have also recently adopted comprehensive data privacy laws. Um, so we have Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, Virginia, Iowa, and there are more states um, jumping into the fray. Um, so, and, and you can see here on this slide, they are often um, enforced, these laws are often enforced by the state attorney general. In some cases, there is uh, something a little bit more specific um, like in Utah, there is the Personal Privacy Oversight Commission. Next slide. Other states who do not have comprehensive uh, data privacy laws still operate enforcement um, actions regarding some privacy laws. Here's a couple of examples in Massachusetts and Nevada. Um, I won't go into these in great detail, but um, just know that if there's, even if there's not a comprehensive law, uh, there may be other laws that apply that um, that are being enforced related to privacy in, in all the states. Next slide. The FTC is, is perhaps the greatest regulator of privacy. Um, violations in the U.S. and has been active for, for many, many years. Um, the FTC enforces laws related to privacy, mainly focused on Section 5 of the FTC Act, barring unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Um, and this often comes up where privacy promises are broken, for instance. Uh, the FTC enforces a, a smattering of other federal laws relating to consumers' privacy and security. Here are some examples on the slide. Um, Truth and Lending Act, Can Spam, um, COPPA, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Protection Act. The FTC primarily will bring an enforcement action and uh, settle with the company requiring uh, affirmative steps to remedy the unlawful behavior. Um, there is a list of current uh, recent settlement agreements here. There's many, many more um, 
And in fact, since this slide was prepared, there has been um, a, an enforcement action against pre-mom um, and Amazon uh, news just came out yesterday. So this is a very active area and uh, one that California lawyers are watching in addition to um, enforcement actions by the state attorney general and uh, the upcoming California Privacy Protection Agency enforcement actions that may occur. Next slide. Another federal regulator in the US is the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. They are enforcing laws relating to privacy mainly around uh, the TCPA, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act uh, regarding unwanted communications, um, mainly around texting and calling. Um, and they are the way they enforce the FTC will open an investigation, issue a letter of inquiry, and take appropriate actions if violations are found. They can also resolve disputes between industry participants via mediation or settlement. Um, the, the FTC has a list of FCC robocall and robotext enforcement actions on their website. There are 52 actions listed there with often million dollars, uh, millions of dollars in fines. So, um, and this has been quite active even in, in you know, as recently as 2022. Um, here are a couple of examples listed here that are in the, the millions of dollars. Next slide. The Department of Health, Health and Human Services, HHS, is a federal agency that enforces HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and its privacy and security rules. So they will investigate complaints, conduct compliance reviews, perform education, and work with the Department of Justice to refer possible criminal violations of HIPAA. Um, there are there is a list of their enforcement results that is kept uh, fairly up to date. And um, as you can see, the, the number of complaints is quite high. Um, and you can see an example here of a $5 million fine uh, regarding a data breach of health information um, as an example of, of a notable enforcement action in the last couple of years. Next slide. The CFPB, often called the Bureau, um, is the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The Bureau enforces laws relating to privacy in the financial sector, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Consumer Financial Protection Act are some examples. Um, they can file an action in federal district court and um, or or initiate an administrative adjudication proceeding in order to enforce. They have a list of enforcement actions through 2022. Um, it's, they're not always related to privacy um, because they're really looking at violations of financial uh, services regulation um, as, well as, that, as well as privacy. Um, one notable enforcement action here related to privacy which included not only the Bureau, but the, the FTC and many states, including the California Attorney General, was a 700 billion fine against Equifax um, regarding a data breach. Next slide. The SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, enforces laws relating to privacy as well, including the Securities Act, uh, the Securities Exchange Act, and the SEC also has its own proposed cybersecurity disclosure rules. They can uh, file an action in federal district court or initiate an administrative adjudication proceeding. They have a list of enforcement actions on their website. Um, something from March 2023, 
uh, was a $3 million penalty for a misleading quarterly report that omitted, omitted material information about the scope of a cyber attack, as an example. Next slide. Moving away from the US and into some a global discussion of regulatory um, enforcement actions, we'll start with the GDPR uh, in Europe. Um, this each each European country union country has to designate its own GDPR data protection authority, also known as a DPA. There's a directory listed here um, with a link to the website. Each DPA is the agency within that European Union, Union country that will um, enforce the GDPR. There's a list of, of countries that uh, here that this applies to. The UK, since it is no longer part of the EU, maintains its own DPA and actually has a GDPR um, version in the UK now. A data protection authority in the EU will review data breach reports, mediate issues like data subject access request, and will also perform education. Um, fines in Europe under the GDPR are quite high. Um, and there, although there is no one source of GDPR enforcement actions, um, many law firms maintain trackers. And here are some notable examples just recently. And, you know, again, the slide is out of date. Um, so, you know, a, a very uh, recent one is uh, a over a billion dollar fine against Meta um, relating to the standard contractual clauses and data transfers. Next slide. The UK, as I mentioned, has its own data protection authority called the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. The ICO will enforce uh, laws relating to privacy, including the UK's version of the GDPR, privacy and electronic communications regulations, and the Data Protection Act of 2018. Uh, they will review complaints, and if there is a need to take an enforcement action, they can also enforce fines similar to GDPR. Uh, the ICO does maintain a list of enforcement actions, and here are some recent examples. Next slide. Other international enforcement actions. Um, this, of course, we can't tour the entire world in this amount of time, but here's some examples from Australia, India, and the Philippines. In Australia, the Australian Privacy Act um, is enforced by its Data Privacy Authority, which is the Office of the Australian Information Commission. There are often you know, cross-border applications that uh, apply when we're looking at other countries. And uh, you can see some penalties listed here under the Australian law. In India, uh, they are working on a proposal for a, a new personal data protection bill. Um, and if passed, that would establish a new regulator in India, the Data Protection Board of India. And in the Philippines, there is the Data Privacy Act that is enforced by the National Privacy Commissioner. And again, there is a cross-border application and penalties listed here. I think that might be the end of my slides. I'll just sum up by, by saying that there's a lot happening um, in terms of enforcement actions that California attorneys tend to track quite closely. As, uh, as you can see from that discussion, it's ever-changing and there's always news happening to pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Do we have any additional uh, discussion on item 2E for the enforcement actions? 
We'll go on to item 2A in our uh, agenda. It's uh, the review and discussion of additional member research regarding privacy laws today. And the presentation will be done by Arsen. Arsen? Great, thank you. Um, and is somebody pulling up the slides? Yeah. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, to the next one. So with the way uh, the data privacy law landscape is in the United States, at the moment, there is no federal omnibus comprehensive privacy law, although there have been some efforts to try to pass one. So instead, uh, the, on a federal level, privacy laws, as you probably already heard in the prior presentation, is enforced by the, primarily by the Federal Trade Commission under Section 5 of the FTC Act. Um, typically, if there is a uh, misrepresentation regarding privacy or personal information handling practices or inadequate safeguards, among other scenarios, uh, Section 5 gives sort of broad authority for the Federal Trade Commission to enforce privacy and security rights violations. Um, in addition, on a federal level, there are sectorial privacy laws. So, for example, um, if you were to collect children's information who are under 13 online from the child, uh, COPPA applies. Um, similarly, with health protected health information, uh, if you're a covered entity, uh, you'll be subject to HIPAA. And then financial institutions who provide um, financial uh, products and services for household or personal use, um, if they collect uh, non-public personal information, the Graham leach bliley Act applies in that scenario. Next slide. On a state level, uh, we're seeing uh, on a rapid pace, uh, comprehensive privacy laws passed throughout the United States. And again, as previously noted in the prior presentation, um, this slide is now outdated because of the fast pace of the privacy laws passing. Uh, California was the first to pass a comprehensive privacy law with the CCPA, which has since been amended by the California Privacy Rights Act, starting January 1st of 2023. Um, then we have Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, uh, with privacy laws that go into effect in 2023. Um, and recently, Iowa also passed a comprehensive privacy law. And what you don't see here is also Indiana, um, Montana, Tennessee, and we have a number of other states with privacy bills pending. So we anticipate by the time following this presentation is over or in a week, um, there might be more and more states passing privacy laws uh, because of the uh, pace that is going at at the moment. Uh, what these privacy laws do is they address a number of things, although they do have their nuanced differences. Um, they do require a transparency and privacy notice before an individual's uh, personal information is collected, used, or disclosed. Uh, they offer certain rights to individuals, such as the right to access, delete, correct, to opt out, uh, among other rights. They create internal obligations for companies to conduct uh, privacy impact assessments for certain high-risk processing activities, um, to abide by certain um, data privacy principles, such as data minimization, to safeguard the data, um, and also there's obligations with respect to um, any, what are, what are called under privacy law service providers or processors to whom you share personal information with um, and that provide a certain service to you to have certain contractual terms um, in your agreements with them, uh, among other obligations under these. Next slide. Um, in addition to comprehensive privacy laws, what we see on a state level are um, each state has a data breach notification law. Um, these laws get triggered when certain types of data, personal information data sets are compromised. Most often the case is uh, first name, last name, in combination with certain sensitive types of data elements, such as social security numbers, uh, financial account numbers with access codes, uh, medical information, among others. Um, and so whenever these uh, data elements are triggered and other conditions are met, there's an obligation to either provide a, well, to provide a notice to the consumer impacted. And under certain circumstances, you may also need to give notice to the state AG's office in the, for that particular state, um, depending on each state's uh, data breach notification law. Next slide. 
Um, of course, this is not a comprehensive covering of every single privacy law in the United States. But just to give a glimpse in California, um, California's constitution also calls for the right to privacy. Um, as I previously mentioned, the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, was the first comprehensive privacy law, and it was passed in California, sort of leading the nation. Um, other than statutory law, there's also always the common law torts, process for torts, such as intrusion into private affairs, public disclosure of private, uh, private facts, uh, false light and misappropriation of name or likeness under the right of publicity statute. And then, of course, uh, uh, in California, and also as is the case throughout the United States, um, there are many sort of unfair business practices act laws, uh, which are often invoked whenever there is a data privacy or security violation. Next slide. That concludes the privacy law overview. Thank you very much, Arsen. Do we have any um, additional discussion on the privacy laws today? Okay. We'll move on to agenda item 2B, which is review and discussion of member research regarding other states with privacy law specialization, and the presentation will be led by Oliver. Oliver? Good morning, everyone, and I'll be very, very brief. As uh, was introduced, I'll be reviewing and discussing the member research regarding other states with privacy law specializations. and. Uh, the information, the source is the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And if you will go to the next slide, I uh, have that listed there. And just for graphical purposes, like I said, this will be very brief. Um, what they did was they laid out with the, uh, fifth, with the 50 states uh, where they uh, lie on the map between requiring ABA accreditation, those that don't, those that are recognized but do not require ABA accreditation, as well as those that uh, are recognized but require state-specific accreditation. Lastly, the two are state-certified accreditations and prohibit certification slash specialization. Two of my colleagues here mentioned, starting with Lindsay, that these are essentially moving targets. And, you know, as this is evolving, uh, things are coming down the pipeline, which may render some of this information slightly dated. But as of the submission of these items, if we go to the next slide, what we'll find here is this key is to identify those that require ABA accreditation. And really, again, for graphical purposes, just for uh, individuals here to sort of see what this looks like laid out throughout the U.S. And the same will be for the next slide. This one is to denote those that uh, where ABA accreditation is not uh, required. Um, and the following slide, if we just take a look at that, we have three here that are to represent, recognize, but do not require uh, accreditation. Uh, the following three slides, same way the lavender, or to represent those that are recognized, but do not require state specific accreditation, followed by TEAL states that are state certified accreditation, and lastly, those that as of the time of this research prohibit certifications and or specializations. Again, this was just to be a sort of brief overview as to what this looks like laid out over uh, the U.S. to support the overall uh, research that is being provided here by my colleagues and I. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Just to just to kind of go back and, and clarify, the blue was recognized but do not require ABA accreditation, and then lavender was recognized but does require state specific accreditation. I think I think uh, you said that it does not require. If I'm I so sorry. Right. Thank you so much for that clarification. You are correct. Okay. Thanks very much, Oliver. Appreciate your research. Uh, do we have any additional discussion on the other states uh, with privacy law specialization? Okay. We will move on to business um, agenda item 2C, which is review and discussion of member research regarding bar associations in California with privacy law focus. And the presentation will be led by Robert. Robert? Hi, 
Uh, yeah, I do want to clarify that the, the, the research that I conducted was not just in California. We looked, the, you know, throughout uh, throughout the, the states um, it for, for this. So anyway, so the methodology behind it uh, was, was basically going on and, and finding 100 uh, different bar or trade associations for lawyers in the country and then visiting their websites and looking to see, uh, did they have a specialty uh, or did they have sections or committees regarding cybersecurity, privacy, data protection, okay? And so um, if you can go to the next slide, there's just a list, uh, I believe, that we put on there, which kind of details the 20 that were found. So it was 20% uh, of these associations that, that were researched had a section or committee. Uh, some of them do cross over into the state and whatnot. And as previously mentioned, this is constantly changing. So of of the additional, I'm sure that there's been more that's been added since the time of that. But um, again, the very fast on this was you know, roughly 20% of the associations that we surveyed uh, had at least a section or committee regarding the specialty. Okay, thank you for the research, Robert. So just to be clear, uh, when we say specialty focus, it means privacy. So what you have identified here is a chart um, with a section that's focused on, on privacy or a committee that's focused on privacy. Is that right? Correct. It's either privacy or they, they designated either, you know, data privacy, data protection, or cybersecurity slash data protection, right? So I, I looked for multiple things rather than just the specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Robert. Any additional discussion on the bar associations with privacy specialty focus? Okay. We'll move on to item 2F, review and discussion of member research regarding public interest and advocacy groups with privacy focus. And it's going to be Michael who is going to be leading that discussion. Michael? Hi, good morning, everybody. I'd like to show just some brief of a few of notable nonprofits and public interest organizations. Uh, I provided numerous uh, organizations, and I don't think that's the best way of just detailing each and every one of them due to the voluminous uh, entities in this field. However, I did look it over and there's some main points. Uh, for public and in, uh, interest organizations, um, they are actively involved in the United States and to some extent globally. First, it's crucial to highlight that many legal Aid organizations and similar public interest groups inherently deal with data privacy due to the nature of their work with the public, as often they are the first places um, that low and medium income individuals do reach out. And these data privacy issues always happen in numerous facets of the law to some extent, or to legal procedures that they handle. However, despite this, a unified set of guidance on data privacy knowledge is notably lacking in these in this sector. So it might be beneficial for us to create laws, or oh, specialization, I mean, and guidelines to help strengthen um, the work, the effort that we make to the public. Uh, several organizations are making strides in this area, however. Um, it's technically nebulous what I'm looking at, but I may be trending crown on other people, but no, most notably the International Association of Privacy Professionals. I'm sorry, um, I'm just um, going to interject. Um, yeah. Should we go to the next slide? Uh, this slide, I like to say, I don't like to, I'll just hate each slide until I'll just do my summary. Sounds um, good. Um, according to this, I'm just saying that um, just highlighting and emphasizing that these places are numerous and also I want to provide a uh, tagline that I'm not advocating or endorsing anything as well as for the state of California. This is purely informational use. Some of the data may be outdated because that's just the nature of stuff. Some organizations may be uh, more beneficial than others. It's hard to say, but they have a public presence and it's noted. And you can go to the next slide. So the first one, 
Uh, it's a technically a nonprofit, and you probably heard of this, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, IA, uh, IAPP. And it's the global resource and organization that provides for the main data privacy certifications. The most notable ones are what the mouse is kind of highlighting. It's the Certified Information Privacy Professional, CIPP. And there's additional exams for privacy manager and privacy technologies, which is CIPM, CIPT. Specifically, they also had um, subsections, so additional concentrations for local areas and geographics with CIPP backslash USA or US for the US private sector. There's one for Canada, one for Asia, and one for Europe. Um, most notably, they're looking at New Hampshire in the United States. And again, they will focus on national and global as indicated with their different specializations. Uh, this is pretty much considered to be the gold standard of non-legal certifications for a privacy professional. Going on to the, and when I mean non-legal, it's not. Today, we talk about a legal specialization of California. This is not a specialization meant only for attorneys. It's meant anyone can, um, through research, education, and getting passing the exam and continuing on with requirements and payment renewals can get. Um, moving on to the next slide. And most notably, I was able to find the American Bar Association's equivalent to it. It's not really one for one equivalent. However, they do have a unique privacy law specialist that they offer. And it, on the uh, main to below of that slide, all the requirements, which I'll just say briefly, to obtain this certification, which is the ABA privacy law specialist, you first need your CIPP certification as well as either a CI, CIPM or CIPT, which is a um, product management, if I recall, and technology, so something like that on the other slide. You must be a member in good standing with at least one US state bar. You must have at least 36 hours of continued legal education and privacy law for the three year period preceding the application. You must provide a personal statement along with at least five peer references attesting to your privacy law experience. You must successfully complete the IAPP's privacy law specialist ethics exam administered by the IAPP or recent multi-state responsible exam score of 80 plus. And you must demonstrate ongoing and substantial experience practicing privacy law defined as at least 25% of your full-time practice over three years. So if you meet those requirements, submit your application, um, it will be up to the determination of the American Power Association, specifically probably the data privacy uh, group to provide this data privacy certificate known as the ABA Privacy Law Specialist. I thought that was a interesting and unique way of an additional certification to really put icing on the cake of your specialized session. I'll move on to the next page. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, this is why I found, again, we don't endorse anything of this nature, but I found, I found the Electronic Discovery Institution, EDI, and it's considered a nonprofit organization focusing on education standards and advocacy. They're located in Washington, D.C., and they're uh, national for the United States. They also provide a data privacy certificate called the EDI Distant Learning Curriculum or something like that. And EDI and its um, faculty will award practitioners, attorneys that complete the full EDI Distant Learning Curriculum with distinguished certificate and di discovery practice. Certificate candidates will be required to complete and pass 70% 40 co uh, curriculum courses, all 40 are available online. Complete a 800 word pu published article about a related discovery topic. And uh, the article will be peer reviewed by the faculty. 
and complete an online declaration and meet identification requirement attesting to the completion of the courses. And complete and pass is seven, up to 70% um, score, I believe, at least two 60-minute elective programs annually to maintain current status. It's most focused on discovery, but it has some tangible benefit to, say, privacy to some degree. Um, that's the only other thing in terms of certifications I found for nonprofits. So if you go on to the next page, and if you proceed on to the additional pages, those are the main groups and entities that I found notably. Of course, I believe the most notable one, again, we don't endorse anybody and we don't sponsor or anything like that, either for me or for the state of California or for anyone on this panel. Those uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, they're considered to be the leading nonprofit defending digital privacy. There's all, and they're looking in San Francisco, California. There's the Privacy Clearing House, California for Consumer Privacy, Center for Democracy and Technology, and it goes on for pages from there. Let me get back to my notes. So hold on. So as I highlighted, um, there are numerous organizations and you can just, uh, let's see, you can, yeah, thank you for skipping to the next page. Um, there's also some notable ones, which is organization combining online abuse. How that's broadly defined is more like um, permissions such as this cyber civil rights initiative and other stuff like promoting digital rights like Access Now. These organizations highlight the breadth and depth of work being done in digital privacy in related areas. There are other diverse organizations working in this sector. Um, I'll, again, there's a lack of formal data privacy licenses for nonprofits besides why listed at the beginning, the three, um, three certificates, at least the main one being IAPP, the second different one is ABA, and then there's the other organization, uh, I can't recall the name, sorry, um, that offers that for discovery if you take the online course exams and keep up on your renewals and everything. Let's see here. The landscape of data privacy is complex and multifactured, as you can probably see we are discussing. And so for a nonprofit, and especially for public interest, it varies about what they can contribute significantly. Oftentimes they highlight on one or two more important avenues, like EFF and their mission to do more like data privacy in California and United States, but there's also groups such as the uh, Access Now and Cyber Civil Rights Initiative that concentrate more on online abuse. And we finish prone to some degree, not to say that they handle it. I know I've seen one or two other organizations, I think on the list who handle that. Um, so it's broadly defined about what is privacy and our concentration is more about information, but I think the public and non um, public interest places with some nonprofits, they focus in on broadly defining privacy to be the person themselves, not necessarily with the data, if that makes sense. So it's not specifically with your address, social security, phone numbers, and two or more personal identifiable information, PII, that combines to be sensitive personal identifier information. Um, it's more concentrating on this uh, tangible, if that makes sense, application to what the public wants or needs. Anyways, um, I think the main point I can summarize is that the breadth of work being done by this organization varies 
in different aspects of data privacy and privacy in general. Um, the, those different values of certificate programs that have been established, that is interesting. But personally, I think I was very interested in the ABA's version of it. But it sounds like it might be overkill for what we need to establish, especially since the bare minimum is a CIPP licenses. And as I brought up in the past, uh, for the public interest and nonprofit, some places just don't have the means or resources to pay for attorneys to obtain it and to maintain it. So it's both obtaining and the time and commitment for that and maintaining that license. Um, Let's see here, the need for a unified guidelines on data privacy knowledge for legal aid organizations and similar public interest groups are pretty much necessary in my opinion, especially since more and more stuff is becoming digitalized, more and more aspects of our life is not only through our phones and computers and um, communications and what we provide, but more everyday life, basic life, such as paying bills, um, paying off, you know, fees and such at grocery stores and having all these data breaches occurring. And I know we brought up Aquifax in the past and how there was a huge breach of it, but that was a huge breach that affected almost everybody. And so that's something in which, um, particular individuals are more well equipped for it, but don't forget that low and medium income individuals probably are being targeted by those most so because they don't have the means or avenues to fight it off. And in relationship to the um, court cases being brought out, um, almost universal, it seems like pro se are not being done. And to some degree, individuals are being represented by law firms, the common public who will reach out to a law firm that they have access and resources and income levels to do so will probably be a nonprofit or a public interest. So to wrap it up, I think the potential benefit of a formal data privacy license for lawyers in California to ensure consistent standards across the legal profession is very critical and necessary. I apologize for the letter um, all over the place. It's just something in which uh, there's a lot of resources. <laughs> and to sum up what this entire research and everything is, I think is the best way to phrase it is, yeah, a nonprofit cannot do everything. So they specialize in one area and they become famous in that. Hence why there's numerous of those. And I think you can see clearly it's not a one-off. There's multiple organizations and these are reasonably all I can find in terms of not going too much into it. And I know one or two organizations or a few may not be even operational today because it just keeps changing and some of them may not have funding. That's based on my research. Uh, Thank you, are there Michael. any questions? Thank you, Michael. Um, the, does the consulting group have any questions or any additional discussion on the uh, public interest and advocacy groups with a privacy focus? We understand, Michael, uh, that this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Thank you very much uh, for the Thank research you. that you have done. Uh, this is uh, meant to be an exercise to show the sufficiency of interest um, in the in the privacy area. So we understand that it's not meant to be exhaustive. Uh, I know. We'll move on to um, item number 2G, review and discussion of member research regarding federal and state legislative interest in privacy. And uh, Paul will be leading that discussion. Paul? Okay, okay, then. So I'm going to talk about the uh, legislators which have a committee or subcommittee dedicated to privacy. And at the, 
At the beginning, I would like to, to highlight first that um, the common trend that, that I've seen well now in my research is that uh, there may not necessarily be a, a dedicated uh, committee or subcommittee on privacy, but it doesn't mean that uh, privacy is not one of the, uh, uh, the, the big areas of, uh, of, of focus. And this trend exists both uh, within the US and internationally. Uh, uh, so I know that uh, in, in my presentation, I focused on the US, but then uh, just uh, you know, like quickly in, in 30 seconds, I wanted to mention that internationally as well, uh, for example, if you look at the European Union, uh, you don't have uh, necessarily uh, uh, parliamentary committees uh, dedicated to privacy. For example, in the European uh, uh, European Parliament, uh, you don't uh, have something which is dedicated to privacy. But then uh, it it is actually part of uh, other uh, other committees. For example, uh, uh, you have um, um, you have this European Parliament's Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice, and Home Affairs. Uh, which uh, is very active in, in, in relation to privacy. Uh, one, one example being that uh, in, in February, uh, they worked on a draft uh, motion for resolution regarding the adequacy of the protection of uh, personal data under the proposed uh, EU-US data privacy framework, which uh, uh, more recently uh, um, uh, was uh, uh, adopted by the uh, uh, by the plenary session of the the, the parliament. So uh, it, it wasn't a committee dedicated specifically to privacy, but then they do look a lot at uh, uh, at privacy. So now, uh, uh, and if we look at at specific countries as well, uh, for example, France, uh, you don't have at uh, the French National Assembly or the Senate something which is again dedicated to privacy but then you do have uh, groups and committees dedicated to civil rights or justice or or, 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 or similar which do look a lot at uh, privacy and it's the same in the united kingdom uh, now moving back to the uh to the united states so on the slide you can see uh, um, at the federal level you have the united states house committee on energy and commerce and uh, they do have a subcommittee, which is actually uh, uh, one um, dedicated to uh, innovation, data, and commerce. And they do mention as well that uh, one of the uh, uh, key, key areas would be privacy matters generally. Uh, and they also mentioned data security being one of their uh, key areas of focus. And uh, even though they, they don't cover only privacy, because as you can see on the list here, they cover consumer product, tourism, uh, for the liability and so forth, they do talk a lot about uh, uh, privacy. So earlier, uh, earlier in the year, whether it's in February or even uh, in, in April, uh, the House Energy and uh, uh, Commerce Committee had a hearing uh, in discussing uh, the uh, uh, the American data privacy uh, uh, framework. So in uh, in uh, April twentieth, uh, for example, there was this hearing on addressing America's data privacy shortfalls, how a national standard fills gaps to protect Americans' personal information. So this is uh, this is one example of a hearing that they've done recently. They've, they've done uh, uh, quite a few as well over the past couple of months. And they did uh, introduce as well last year a federal bill on uh, uh, data privacy, which uh, didn't uh, uh, it, it didn't come to pass on, uh, due to uh, various reasons, but it was proposed and it's still being, uh, uh, it, even though it, it, it wasn't passed last year, and uh, uh, what, what happens is that now they're still uh, bringing up uh, the potential uh, uh, possibility of uh, you know, bringing up a new federal bill on the data protection. Moving on to the next uh, slide, uh, you have uh, at the standard level as well, you have the U.S. and Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation, who has a subcommittee on consumer protection, product safety, and data security. So here you have a bit more of a, uh, they do mention as well specifically that they do cover consumer privacy and data security protection and international data transfer issues. Uh, those are big topics for them. Uh, the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary as well has a subcommittee on privacy, technology, and the law. Uh, and they do mention as well that they uh, uh, they have their jurisdiction covers online privacy issues, uh, and they mention privacy, digital safety, and security. Uh, so so th those are the you know the, the key uh, uh, subcommittees I would say at the federal level. If we move on to the state uh, level, uh, we have <clears throat> we have in California the uh, the state assembly has a standard. A standing committee, which is specifically focused on privacy, 
uh, it is in fact called the Committee on Privacy and Consumer Protection. And they do mention as well that uh, this committee has jurisdiction over matters related to privacy, the protection of personal information, including digital information, the security of data and information technology, among other things. Uh, there is also a select committee on the cybersecurity. And uh, as we all know, and as uh, uh, the other presenters mentioned earlier, uh, California does as well have uh, uh, two different privacy laws, uh, which were passed the, Con uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act and the California Privacy Rights Act. Moving on to uh, the next uh, slide, if we look at the other states, uh, things are, are, are a bit different here because uh, the, the other states may not necessarily have a committee or subcommittee calling out specifically privacy in their description uh, or in, their, uh, in, in, in the scope of responsibilities and so forth. It doesn't mean that privacy is not uh, something that uh, they look at very ca uh, carefully. We have to bear in mind that uh, uh, for, for, the, for the other states, uh, uh, they, most of them either do not yet have a privacy law or they have already introduced one, but then it hasn't yet entered into effect. It, uh, as uh, also mentioned earlier, uh, those privacy laws would be uh, coming into effect in the, in the next couple of months uh, uh, and, and, and so forth. So that could also explain why there is a bit of a lag. Uh, uh, so in, in, in Colorado or, or Washington, you have... Uh, uh, you, you do have committees which look at technology or civil rights, and uh, they have passed uh, 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 they, they have passed a privacy uh, uh, a, a bill uh, uh, which will enter into effect in the uh, in, in, in the near future. And if you moving on to the next slide as well, uh, it's the same situation for the other states, whether it's uh, Virginia, Utah, and uh, Iowa. Uh, they have introduced uh, legislation. In, uh, and uh, for example, for Iowa, well, uh, I guess the slide is a bit outdated now. Uh, that has already uh, been uh, enacted, but it hasn't entered into effect. So that's in 2025 in Virginia and Utah. It's also uh, those committees have also been at the origin of uh, uh, privacy laws, which have been uh, introduced in the states. Uh, and those uh, uh, those those laws would uh, uh, for, for Utah to enter into effect in December. And uh, yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, in summary, I would just say that just because uh, there isn't, uh, it, just because privacy hasn't been specifically called out in the name doesn't mean that uh, uh, it's not an area of focus. Uh, and th that's, uh, oh, that would be misleading. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for the presentation on not only the federal and state uh, legislative interests, but also mentioning some of the, the non-US uh, international legislative uh, focus. Is there any additional discussion from the members on item 2G? Okay, then we have the last item on the agenda, which is item 2H, and that's the discussion, a review and discussion of member research regarding law schools with privacy law curriculum, and Smita is going to be leading that discussion. Smita? Great, thank you. Awesome, thanks everybody. Um, for your patience. I'm the last one, so I'm gonna keep this really quick <laughs> so that we can all go and have lunch, hopefully. Um, so yeah, privacy law education has increasingly become prominent in California's curriculum. Um, you know, and I think California schools have started to recognize the significance of legal frameworks and regulations in protecting individuals' privacy rights. We've heard a little bit about that earlier today. Um, and I feel like the state law schools have taken proactive steps to ensure the students are knowledgeable about privacy laws and their implications in the, in the digital realm. So um, these are the ABA accredited law schools in California. Of these, um, 14 of these, um, when I went on the website, I could identify have um, privacy related dedicated curriculum. Um, they some of these also have centers and uh, if we go to the next slide you can see those um so you know some of these have also like have information privacy law and you know to paul's point some of the courses might not have the word privacy in them but you know it's cybersecurity or you know related uh, topics which do talk about um you know, the definition of personal information, data protection regulations, consent requirements, um, 
deletion of data, all of these were topics that came up on the law school websites that I looked at. Um, several of them have clinics, uh, which provide very practical, hands-on experience to students um, so they can interact with privacy professionals and learn from them um, or, you know, shadow or do an internship. I, I feel like there were a lot of links and materials on these websites that offered uh, things like that, just beyond just offering courses. Um, there's another slide. I think this is a repeat. There's one more slide. Sorry. Yeah. So you can see that these are all this, the courses and the law schools. Of course, there's the caveat that these courses may not be offered in every semester, and they may be subject to change depending on professors' course load, and all of that. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, California law schools um, and their curriculum is very representative of generally, I think, the state's interest in protecting privacy and advancing privacy education. Thanks very much, Smita. Any additional discussion on the law schools with privacy law curriculum? Hi, Jiwon. Can I just add on one thing? Sure. Um, I, I teach at Santa Clara uh, University School of Law, and I'll just uh, share that that we have a privacy law certificate um, program, and I, I think that might be interesting to see, um, you know, how many schools come up with a, a certificate um, program similar to that. Um, and just, I see a lot of students very interested in privacy generally, so. Thank you, Lindsay. Any other questions or discussion on the agenda items? Um, I would just echo as well uh, what Lindsay mentioned, uh, because I also teach at the uh, University of California Hastings in San Francisco. And uh, yeah, lots of interest from students. And uh, uh, another point as well is that law schools, they do have uh, uh, programs that they have, uh, um, they have signed up with uh, the IEPP, for example, whereby uh, they would uh, have uh, trainings and so forth so that students can prepare for the uh, the CIPP certification and mm -hmm. so forth. So the, the, in addition to the, uh, the the courses which are officially available for, from, uh, uh, from, from the professors and so forth, there, there are also a possibility for students to take uh, uh, trainings directly with the IEPP so that they can sit for the CIPP exams and they get uh, discounted mm -hmm. rates as well with uh, for, for those certifications, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'll also add that I was asked to co-teach a U.S. privacy law course for the Maastricht University. And so, you know, although the presentation today of Asmita really focused on the California um, law schools, um, I think there is absolutely an interest um, outside of California, in you know, other states, and even in Europe and non-U.S. countries. Uh, in having U.S. privacy law courses taught. And so I think that really kind of goes to our, sh our showing of a uh, need and interest in specialization. Um, I think, Janelle, we can go to the next step. Um, and, you know, before uh, we have Janelle kind of speak to us about the next steps, I want to take a moment to really thank, um, and I'm so grateful, um, you know, and, and really applaud uh, each member of this consulting group for the tremendous effort um, that you have all put in. Um, each of you um, has put in a, a significant amount of time and effort in researching and preparing the materials for the presentations today. We are very, very grateful for all of the work that you have done. Um, I would also like to, um, to thank uh, my vice chair, Ryan Davis, and Adrian and Janelle, who have really assisted in coordinating uh, all the presentations today. Um, just to uh, reiterate the assessment questions that we were asked to uh, task to discuss today with the research and the presentations were, is there sufficient need and interest to create a privacy law specialty? And second, is the area sufficiently defined to create a useful specialization? Those are the two questions that we were asked to respond to, and the presentations, um, I believe, answered uh, those two questions uh, for us. So, Janelle, please tell us, what is the next step? Adrian, if you don't mind pulling up that slide, please. So, what, first, I would like to thank everyone for attendance in our presentation today as well. It was a very informative meeting. 
Um, I just want to let you guys know what's next for this uh, consulting group. First, we would like to um, ask if there's two volunteers to work with staff in creating the proposal that will be uh, submitted to the CBLS for review and approval. That's one. Uh, the second, um, once that uh, proposal has been drafted, we'll go ahead and um, look over that at our next meeting um, for approval on Thursday, September 28th. I will send out a meeting invite to all those to make sure that is put on your calendar. Um, and, and if that is approval um, from you is made, that will go to the CBLS meeting in December. Um, once the CBLS approves a proposal, we will go ahead and move forward with researching and start drafting the standards for the certification, the exam specifications, as well as the CLE subjects and others. Um, so are there two volunteers that would like to work with staff to get the proposal together for the CBLS? I see Lindsay raised her hand. I'm curious about it, but I was curious about what type of our commitments or work that will be needed in assisting. It'll be reviewing essentially all the material that was uh, um, provided today, um, putting it together, um, I think that if we had um, like a written proposal as well as additional slides to um, um, supplement or to um, kind of go with uh, that written proposal for presentation to the CBLS, um, I think that'd be fantastic. So I see a hand raised by Lindsay. Are you volunteering or do you have a question? I'm volunteering. Thank you, Lindsay. Any others? Thank you, Lindsay. If um, we don't have a second volunteer, then it defaults to Ryan and me. So we're hoping that we have a second volunteer. Chair, Vice Chair. So I, I can help review it. I just don't know about my time commitment in the next month or two. Especially so we do have to family. limit, uh, because of the Badgley Keen Act, we do have to limit to two people. But in terms of timing, what's going to happen is, uh, so the two of our consulting group, we're going to be working with the, the materials that were presented today, packaging it in a way that is going to go to uh, CBLS. And everyone, um, the entire consulting group will meet again at the next meeting, September 28th, and have another opportunity to discuss, make any refinements that we want to make, and then that proposal, if approved, will go to the CBS meeting in December. So I would say, Michael, if you're not sure about being, you know, those two, because we only can have two at a time that can work on this, um, then we are very happy to have you participate during the September discussion. Probably the September discussion, I will be more active for it. Um, unfortunately, like Zaf, a personal family commitment, um, any issues for the past month or two? that I have to predict may limit my capacity. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So Ryan, uh, would you like to be the second person or should I? I'm happy to do it. All right. Okay. So Lindsay and Ryan, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate your help. Uh, we'll be working directly with Adrian and Janelle to prepare the presentation um, that we will be reviewing and also voting on at the next meeting on September 28th. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Um, if not, uh, we will adjourn today's meeting. Okay, hearing none, this is going to conclude all of the open session items um, at this point. Uh, we are going to uh, stop the recording and the webcast, and we'll see you at the next meeting in September. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And it's that.